Hello. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to episode 28 of the Kennedy Americans podcast. I'm your host, Lori Spencer. We are live on X, formerly known as Twitter, of course. Um, if you are live here in the space, I'm going to ask everyone here to please take a moment to retweet that space and get that out to your friends. And my cat just said hello. <laughs> that was my cat, Jacqueline Kennedy. Yes, my cats are the Kennedy cats. Don't make fun of me. <laughs> I've got Jack and Jackie, the parents, and then I've got uh, fraternal twins, a boy and a girl, Caroline and John John. Of course. <laughs> um, we're going to put this out a little bit later this week as an episode of the podcast. So it'll go out on other platforms besides just X. Not everybody uses Twitter. A lot of people don't know how to use X spaces yet. So we like to get it out on as many platforms as, as we can to get the word out to people. So uh, later this week, this will be out on YouTube and Rumble and Facebook and Twitch and as many platforms as we can. Um, we're just trying to get the good word out there about Mr. Kennedy's campaign. And we, tonight, of course, we've got a really hot topic. We've got uh, a new vice presidential running mate that was announced yesterday, Tuesday, this week, out in Oakland, California. Mr. Kennedy announced his long-awaited vice presidential running mate, and it came as a big surprise. It, no one was ready for it. Everyone was thinking, Aaron Rodgers, Jesse Ventura, Mike Rowe, uh, Tulsi Gabbard, we were hoping, a lot of us, myself included, we're hoping for Tulsi. And there was that feeling, I know that a lot of you can relate to what I'm saying, that when Kennedy said her name, there was this kind of collective, oh, and people were saying, who? Who is she? Who is Nicole Shanahan? It was the first time a lot of people had ever even heard her name. Um, but we got a great introduction to her yesterday. Um, we got to hear her story about her life. And it, I found it very inspiring. I have to tell you, I'm a tough critic. And uh, she's a breath of fresh air. Really interesting woman, really smart woman. And I get the strategy here. And I think it's brilliant. Um, and I'll explain what I mean by that. I think it was a brilliant move to pick a intelligent, successful, strong woman, an ethnic minority from Kamala Harris's hometown. Woo, that's awesome. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. And she's been a lifelong Democrat and a big Democratic donor. So not only will this put the, ban the Biden White House in a panic, uh, I bet Kamala Harris got pretty drunk last night. <laughs> I want to bring in my co-host, Augustus. Great to see you here, Augustus, with Team Kennedy. Thank you so much for joining us. I see several friends here. And also, I want to talk to Johnny because Johnny was out there yesterday. We were doing live team coverage on Maverick News. I'm sure a lot of you were watching yesterday. Thanks for tuning in. We just kind of made it a watch party. Um, and we had a lot of our Kennedy volunteers and Kennedy staffers on the show with us yesterday from the venue. Johnny was there with his camera, got uh, some great footage, you know, of the crowd outside and, you know, people standing in line waiting to get in. It was a huge crowd. And we even got to see some of the uh, probably paid protesters that the Democratic uh, Party sent. And they were out there with their Biden signs across the street uh, trying to counter protest the Kennedy rally. So, Johnny, I wanted to bring you in and tell me what that was like. You seemed surprised to even see them there. Um, tell me what was said, what they said, and uh, what exactly were they protesting? You know, yeah, <laughs> I guess they're protesting uh, reason or uh, cynicism towards uh, repeat criminal fraudsters. I don't know. Yeah, they. Uh, yeah, it's funny how that propaganda can can work. How people can can look at our guy and say, "Oh, you know, he's he's a he's a crazy anti-vaxxer." It's like, well, have you have you listened to him? Because I think it's crazy not to be cynical of uh, you know, big pharma. They are you know this industry that before COVID, you know, they were like the least trusted and just had the worst reputation. And yeah, billions of dollars in criminal penalties for fraud, but. Yeah, they got their protesters out there saying, hey, you don't want to take all the vaccines that we're trying to put on the kids that we're not testing? You know, what's what's wrong? What's up with that? And 
Yeah, so they were out there in force. It was it was fun. I like to go and uh, share with them. It's 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 not easy to get through to them, but you know I think now and then you know you can plan a seed, and uh, if they're open to reason, maybe they'll come around. But there was only yeah, there was only five of them, so they didn't. I don't think the DNC paid too much to have them out there. That was. Uh, <laughs> A, a week show. Well, weren't they all like old people? From what I could see, they look like retirees who had a lot of time on their hands in the middle of the day. They were, they were, they were like, uh, they were boomers. I would guess they were all about 65 plus. Yeah, they were probably all retirees. And, um, you know, I get it. You know, back back in the day, you know, uh, Mr. Kennedy talks about, you know, you could trust the news, Walter Cronkite, and uh, people would show both sides of the news. And now it's just this agenda driven narrative that they put up. And, you know, it's uh, it's wild. You know, back in the day, you know what? A lot of people had three three vaccines when they were when they were kids. Right. I'm three a fat generation. And, and I, I took three when I was a kid. And I remember Walter Cronkite. That's how old my ass is. <laughs> <laughs> or I remember, remember when you can trust and the news. <laughs> isn't that sounds nice? That that sounds quaint. Doesn't that sound great? It was oh great. Gosh. Yeah. I, but, I, I was lucky to work in the news business in the 1980s and 90s. Back when people still trusted us, I was, you know, in radio news, but uh, we were a trusted news source and we did real journalism. And sadly, that's just dead. That's dead and gone. It's incredible. So, yeah, I had I had a time talking to them and yeah, and I uh, took some interviews of some people standing in line. Um, There was a lot of ambient noise. I got to get a a better mic for being out in those conditions. It was pretty windy, but yeah, it was a great turnout, uh, cool historic location. And yeah, it was exciting to see. Uh, yeah, so many great speakers. Yeah, Callie Means was there. You know, he's. Uh, I really love the awareness he's been bringing to. Uh, yeah, what Big, Big Farm has been doing with Ozempic. And yeah, I was really. Uh, I thought. I thought our gal did a really great job. Uh, it's Nicole Shanahan. Um, yeah, sharing those words there, I was really impressed. And uh, yeah. I was uh, delighted, delighted to see, you know, we, we got to make all food safe. You know, we, this is a, it's, it's like a, a Holocaust that's taken us out. I think 20 million of us have died early in this country and no one's talking about it. And so to uh, have uh, Mr. Kennedy and Shanahan focused on that, you know, I, I think that just makes all the sense in the world. And yeah, I'm, uh, I'm stoked to that somebody's talking about it because it's, it's so important. Yeah, I mean, that's right up your alley. <laughs> so much of what she said in the speech yesterday about healthy food, uh, about regenerative farming. I mean, she was talking right to you, Johnny. That is your wheelhouse. You must have been beside yourself <laughs> with happiness. And it was great to see that you got uh, a selfie with Bobby and Nicole after the speech. Yeah, you know, I had a nice shirt I had printed up. I wanted to kind of give to one of them, and I kind of forgot to. But, you know, I got to share with them, you know, um, let's make all food safe again. And, yeah, with God, all things are possible. And, uh, yeah, just share my uh, – share that I love what they're doing. So, yeah, it's uh, great great to be able to connect them that way. They're real, guys. I actually got to shake their hands. Incredible. I, you know, I I wasn't sure what to think at first, and I'm sure a lot of you didn't. Um, And it was our first chance to get to know Nicole Shanahan yesterday. Um, You know, they played that wonderful short video of an interview with her before the speech. Did you like that video? Loved it. Loved it. It was very emotional. Good. You know, Um, and I could tell she, you know. Our team worked really hard on that. I can tell. I mean, I I have to compliment Team Kennedy on the production of that event yesterday because uh, I remember early in the campaign, like the very first live stream from Boston last April went horribly wrong. (laughs) There were all kinds of technical problems. And uh, in the past, we've had a lot of issues with live streams going smoothly. But I don't know who you've hired, but the production yesterday was just smooth and seamless and looked very professional. Uh, The best live stream for Kennedy 24 that I've seen yet. So my compliments to the crew. All the videos were beautifully done. It was really well produced. The music was great. The musical artists that they had on the bill. Augustus, uh, can you tell us who was playing uh, yesterday? There was that wonderful version of America, the beautiful, the uh, lady who sang. Man, what a voice. 
Does anyone know her name? It escapes me at the moment. That was um, Mika Hill. Mika Hill? Man, she is... Mika Hill. I'm not sure who it was, but yeah, she had a great voice. Didn't she? Uh, <laughs> it was Mika Hale. <clears throat> Hale? Hale. Yeah, I said Hale. Mika Hale. Okay. Yeah. Man, she was absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. And it's great to see so many friends here. I see Pasta made it. I'm going to send Pasta a speaker's request because we were supposed to have him on the panel with us at Maverick News yesterday. And then the speeches started. And so we all had to shut up and the panelists didn't get to speak. <laughs> we had him sitting backstage and he never got a chance to actually say anything. So let me send him a co-host invite. See if Pasta wants to hop on with us for a little while. And I'm going to send one out to Jay. Jay Scott was with us yesterday on Maverick News. And anybody else who would like to speak, if you want to get up on the panel, uh, just send me a speaker's request and I'll add you. I want to hear everybody today. I want to get a wide range of opinions. And I'm especially interested in what uh, Craig Costa Jardula thought of Nicole Shanahan. Craig, the mic is all yours. Well, thank you, Lori Spencer, for having me on. You know, I just called to chit-chat with you on a personal level to say I love your new hairstyle. You're looking great. You're sounding great. You know, even though we don't agree on the Kennedy situation where we once were in the same spot, I still love you. I think the work you guys are doing over there at Maverick News is is awesome. Um, I'm I'm excited to come on. Uh, I'm actually going to catch a flight, so I can't stay for long. But um, there have we been a lot of people... You. <laughs> you love having me, and I love talking to you, girl, no matter what, you know? And always, despite, always. Despite our differences, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, right. A lot can change in six months. Damn it can. Work. Yeah. <laughs> what well, is so stupid? You keep pissing off my friends, Lori, and I'm going to have to silence you, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Uh-oh. Troublemaker. Well, some of your friends are pissing me off, too. I know. I told them. I would better watch with Lori Spencer. She's from Tulsa. She will kick your behind. She'll Forget about it. That's right. <laughs> I got to get out to Tulsa anyways. My good friend Jeremy Kozmaroff, who I've been doing this new segment called LOL, uh, which doesn't mean le uh, laugh out loud. It means left on left, where the left criti uh, critiques itself and laughs out loud to keep ourselves from crying. And we are trying <laughs> to make a push uh, to get these segments on some of the Pacifica radio stations. We've been in contact with them. I don't know if I should let the cat out of the bag, uh, but a couple other uh, radio stations as well. Uh, and that's why we've come together for these uh, particular critiques and uh, segments that we're doing. Um, and there are a lot of people here that are friends with you and people who are Kennedy supporters till this day have been reaching out to me. I think Keith is one of them. Uh, Keith, I can't remember his his call sign, but he had said something to me. Can we have a serious conversation about Kennedy? Uh, in other words, saying that even though he, despite his awful takes on Israel, which Keith, I think, even agrees with me that it's an awful take, and you might even be there in that camp as well, but still finding value in other areas. Um, Ms. Shanahan, yesterday, the new vice president pick, uh, had spoke about things that I was so excited, and the reason why I wanted Kennedy on that ticket uh, because I want to talk about our food. I want to talk about food sovereignty. I want to talk about GMOs. I want to talk about the poisoning of our citizens through uh, beef and pork and all these other situations where, you know, uh, in Russia, you know, Vladimir Putin signed into law the banning of GMOs while we're signing into law the banning of GMO labeling. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's turned upside down. And I think these are so many great values that RFK uh, was bringing to the table when he initially announced he was going to run. However, I think the biggest thing that I have to point out is that I don't believe that RFK is just wrong in his analysis of uh, Israel. I believe that he's compromised. And it's a big difference, for instance, when you say that, you know, uh, Dr. Cornell West, you know, who you obviously I think a lot of people saw the interview with Jimmy Dore and Cornell West. They probably saw my interview before that. The insiders who, who pay attention to what's going on and we disagree on a lot of things. I do feel that Dr. Cornell West is wrong in the rhetoric he uses I do think he's wrong in some of the things he concentrates on. But uh, one of the biggest issues right now, and it is the biggest issue, uh, Israel-Palestine, I think he is on the mark with that. And uh, I think he understands and uh, knows how to speak. And I think that Dr. Cornell West is not compromised. I think he's just wrong in his analysis. Uh, it, it's a big difference because if you are compromised, and a lot of people believe that Bobby is compromised, 
uh, then you can be compromised on any issue when the uh, lords of the universe, the masters of the universe, say you got to do such and such. So I think that's why you know I don't find any more excitement in Bobby Kennedy. I don't think uh, that it's worth. He, I find value in him in other issues that he brings so many interesting points to the table. I, you, you, when somebody is compromised, it's totally different than when somebody is just plain wrong. Now. Not only the situation when it comes to Israel, and people will say, well, you knew his stance on Israel, Pasta. You're the one who went up there and asked him his stance on Israel, Palestine, and he gave you the answer. Yes. Had he come out and said, I stand with Israel as far as they should exist as a state, as a people, they have the right to do so. However, we do need a ceasefire. We need a ceasefire immediately before innocent civilians get killed. Had Bobby Kennedy taken that position, I think the game would have been totally different. I think so many people that were fought once following him or supporting him would have continued to support him. But the fact he has gone full-blown Zionism, and I, I think he's just too smart, Lori, personally me, he's just way too smart to get this wrong, and he's repeating some of the stuff that I heard with my friends out here in Boca Raton, Florida, you know, where Hebrew school wasn't Hebrew school. It was Zionist school. It was about the state of Israel. It really, you know, doesn't go hand-in-hand hand with uh, Judaism. You know, it's completely different in my personal opinion. So therefore, that's why, you know, and as, as, as Sam Husseini, and I know there's a lot of people who in this particular chat, and people who support Bobby Kennedy, probably wouldn't like Sam Husseini's rhetoric, but I think he's the one who hit it right on the nose. This guy, Bobby Kennedy, has split the anti-establishment movement right in half. Because we were standing hand in hand with those people who were against the COVID protocols, who were against the lockdowns, who had looked at this situation when it came to this uh, this disease or this virus as a bioweapon. We were there with them. We, uh, the anti-imperialist that left, you know, leftists that I am, the people who spoke against the rage of the war, against the war machine with those libertarians, we had found common ground, you know, with those people on the right. And I think Dave DeCamp made the best tweet on October seventh when I was praying, Lori. Somebody take the phone out of Bobby Kennedy's hand. Do not let him tweet. <laughs> can somebody grab his phone, right? Yo, it does. Can I can You're I chime right? in real quick? I, I'm, I'm gonna finish up my thought. I, I, let me just I'm say gonna, I'm there gonna there finish my rules. thought. And, yeah. Two rules don't don't blow any guys. vessels, brain. Never <laughs> ever tweet when you're drunk and never yes. tweet when you're angry. And yeah, Bobby fired off that tweet yeah. on October seventh yeah. when he had a head full of steam. But who yeah. didn't? I mean, on October seventh, we were all extremely emotional and i can certainly yeah. forgive him for his anger that night well just can finishing up my thought in? yeah i'm going to finish up my thought and i'll hand it right over to you just saying uh plain and simple when that decision came down and his position on israel palestine to, still to this day supporting what the netanyahu government does and then yesterday's decision of that vice president i think it's all but over please go ahead well, i i don't know uh how tuned in to what the campaign is doing and what uh who is this by the way talking about <laughs> <laughs> sorry what who is this by the way just so i know who who is uh, i can say your name augustus. We... augustus nice to meet you buddy augustus works with team kennedy he does our graphic design yes. for the campaign staffer love that name loved you and willy wonka you stole the show yeah thanks that, that wasn't funny i'm sorry <laughs> appreciate it um <laughs> Yeah, like I just was just saying, <clears throat> I don't know how tuned in to uh, some of the recent uh, events that Robert Kennedy's been doing or uh, what the campaign's been doing. But um, over a month ago now, uh, I think it's now been like a month and a half, maybe two months, uh, has he been coming out saying that <clears throat> he's pro-Palestine, that he's pro-Palestine and anti-Hamas. And if that's something that exactly. you you think is uh, wrong, um, then it, elaborate. What's wrong with that? I, I, I hate to tell you, I lost you there for a second when you said pro-Palestine. Um, but from what I did catch, you said about a month and a half ago, right? I said um, for over a month now, um, mm -hmm. he's been at events talking with people bring, that bring up this topic. And he mm -hmm. set out his mouth. He's pro-Palestine, but anti-Hamas. Mm -hmm. Which is a very reasonable well, you, If you'd like me to elaborate on that, uh, it's a little bit too late for that. We're, we're talking October 6th uh, was a, quite some time ago. We got 35,000 Palestinians, mostly civilians, women and children that are killed. 
He still has a very close relationship with Rabbi Shmuley. In fact, a lot of people thought yesterday How that it might that? be Rabbi Shmuley being announced on that stage. How, Even Joe Biden you know in the United States for the first time ever has now not vetoed a ceasefire. Um, so unfortunately, I think it's just gone too far too fast, and it's there. there's no turning back now. Um, I'm, I'm not going to say that I'm not happy. I'm happy that anybody's everybody's doing this now, but I think it's just a little bit too late, and a lot of people believe that it's politically motivated at this point. It, it wasn't humanitarian motivated. Well, you know, I, I should add his most recent interview last week with Reuters. Uh, you know, Kennedy's very clear that he deplores the tragedy that's happening to the Palestinian innocents who are caught in the crossfire. But he also said in that interview that Hamas must be Are we there destroyed. still? He said right. Hamas I'm, must be destroyed. Right. I mean, I, I believe he, he's he right tweeted about out too multiple times about how um about how if you are truly standing with the Palestinian people, then you should be against Hamas. Because Hamas is exactly. infringing on the Palestinian people uh, on, on so many different levels. So that's what he stands for. That's what he said he stands for. And um, if you're pro Hamas, then I, I don't know what, why, why, how we're even going to have a conversation. Craig. It seems to me, I, I agree with Mr. Kennedy that the most humanitarian thing that we can do for all of the people, the people of Israel and the people of Gaza, is to smash Hamas. No one is more responsible for enslaving the Palestinian people than Hamas. Right. You know? That's that's exactly right. So, um, you know, standing with the people, standing with the Palestinian people, I think is uh, very important um, and is the right thing to do. But in the same in the same vein you you also need to weed out these bad bad actors these um hamas warriors that uh are basically after um that they're basically going to infringe upon the freedoms of the palestinian people yeah. Can I can I say something about that too cuz I think we still I mean you've been you've yeah. been running the show yeah. so go ahead Yeah it's <laughs> Well, I just wanted to respond. I think this whole Hamas situation that we have to weed these people out is still just a neoliberal talking point. It's a conservative talking point that really just holds no water. Hamas was elected because, once again, the Israeli government is the one who pushed forth and funded them. This is something that Ron Paul has said on the floor. This is something that Netanyahu has said in 2019 to his Lukit party, right, the, at the Knesset, when he said, plain and simple, that if you want to see... Uh, a pro-Israel uh, state exists. We need to fund and support Hamas. And he said this in 2019. You know, and my friend Kurt Metzger would say, ah, oh, man, and he'd come to think about it, I gave up on Hamas in 2014. But yet here they are again and whatnot. The people elected them. And at what choice do they have when you have so many children held as prisoners, air quotes over there and whatnot, are you going to see a people stand by their oppressors or the next best thing, anybody who stands up to their oppressors? So you can't lift up and support Hamas and then turn around and point the finger and say Hamas, 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 Hamas. It's just an excuse. And we criticize Bernie Sanders for saying having the same rhetoric. Right. I mean, you clearly haven't been listening to what Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has been saying. So with that being said, I'm excited to see what uh, Shanahan's uh, going to be doing and what um, new developments are in that in that uh, part of the campaign? And if I could, I, I, cl I clearly have been listening to what RFK has been saying. I'm the one who asked him about his state position in Israel Palestine. And like I said, the change of rhetoric a little well, bit too late. You didn't know that he said he was pro Palestine. It, you didn't it's even a hear, little you bit didn't too hear that part, or on how he said he was anti Hamas. It's a little bit too late. I, I just told you a little bit so too late. You haven't been listening. Because people have stopped listening, because like I told you so from you the beginning, listening. Augustus, because we feel he is compromised. Well, you just you you can't say that you have been listening, and then in the same breath say you stopped listening. This is a straw man argument, August Augustus. I'm sorry, brother. Hey, pasta. I have a straw question. man argument. Yes. You're saying that you have been listening to what he's been talking about, and then in the same breath saying you stopped listening to him. 
We You're stopped listening to for like, we we stopped Trump listening to the guy a while ago. We, we stopped listening to him a long. Time. Listen, I understand you. This is your hero, and you're you're going to get upset because people don't want to support your I'm hero. Not upset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You obviously are. You're raising your voice and saying, "Yeah, you're the same breath." Yada yada yada. I've st- we've stopped listening to Robert Kennedy. We don't believe him anymore. I'm only raising, but my we voice listen to him to be heard because you can't yeah. stop talking. I have to talk over you. Gentlemen, okay, no I fighting in the war room. <laughs> 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 my favorite line from Doctor Strange Love. <laughs> Pasta, I have a question. Have you? Sure. Okay, I know you said you're. You know you haven't been checking out Kennedy's latest interviews, but have you heard episode one thirty seven of the RFK Junior podcast? It's called "The Path to Peace," and he is dialoguing with two peace activists. One is Israeli, one is Palestinian, and it's a, a fascinating episode. It's about an hour and a half long conversation, and it's recent. I think it just came out last week or so. I was wondering if you'd had a chance to listen mm-hmm. to that one, Craig. Uh, I have not, but I'll tell you what, Lori, I will listen to it for you because I respect and love you and I love what you're doing. So I'm going to listen to it. But I think I'm going to have the same feelings and opinions I've had for quite some time. I'm just not going to simply believe RFK anymore. I believe well, here's what I liked about that podcast. Bobby didn't do much talking. Instead, he just listened. He was listening to both sides, taking it in. And that is the thing that sets him apart, I believe, from Trump, from Biden, from everyone else in this race, is that he's always learning. You know, the guy is 70 years old and he's still learning. He's quite educated on the Middle East, knows the topic. I mean, you'll never hear Joe Biden sit down and answer questions about this situation the way that Bobby What's wrong with Trump? And it's the same with Trump. Uh, Trump doesn't really go into detail the way that Bobby does. Bobby's still learning about it and he has an open mind. He's really wanting to listen to both sides. And I truly believe, even though I, I know that he's not necessarily telling you what you want to hear, um, if you give him a chance, I think he would be obviously of the three, the most dedicated to finding or hoping, hopefully brokering some kind of lasting mutual peace, if that's even possible. But my Trump personal actually thoughts on it, a peace yeah. in the Middle East, like, for what it's Trump worth, has various peace uh, my personal thoughts on it is that, you know, this conflict has gone on for more than a century. Every American president has tried at one point or another to broker that peace. Um, and it's just never worked. And this is a problem that Jesus Christ himself, if he came back to Earth, could not solve. Um, You know, the two state solution, even though Bobby believes in it and I disagree with him on this, I don't think it's possible, especially after October the 7th, when both sides don't want to cease fire. You can't force a cease fire on two parties who do not want to stop a war. They're in it. It's their war. They're going to keep fighting it. We can't force it on him no more than we could force a two state solution on two parties who do not want a two state solution. That's always been the problem, you know. Um, and I don't know if Bobby can solve that. I think it's like we're asking more of him than we would ask of Jesus Christ himself. Um, there's only so much an American president can do. All they can do is facilitate conversations. And that's why I like this new podcast, because that's very presidential, is to just facilitate the conversation. And sometimes it's best to just shut up and listen. And that's exactly what Bobby did. And I think you, would, in particular, Pasta, would enjoy that podcast. So hopefully you'll get a chance to listen. Yeah. Well, make sure you set. Make sure you send it to me, right? So I can listen I did. to it. I just posted. And Augustus just fell on out. In the nest. Perfect. Up at the top of the space, everybody. Okay. If if folks out there listening would like to check it out too, it's episode one thirty seven called "The Path to Peace," the Robert F. Kennedy Jr. podcast. Uh, yeah. And, and for the record, I went and followed uh, Augustus over there. So if he follows me back. And we can mess each other. Well, that's open dialogue. I'm always down to listen and learn and talk more. I see him in there, brother. I, I, I followed you. You can follow me. And I'm more than willing to have more of these conversations to let you know where my where I stand to as well. Because right now I'm in a quagmire myself. Yeah, if it came down to the three people, Trump, Biden, or B- Bobby Kennedy, I think Bobby Kennedy would be the easy solution right there. Would not. But, you know, there are other people in the race. And um, it's going to be a hard decision. I'm going to, even though I don't believe that are Election systems are fair, and you guys know that because that's the bulk of my work for anybody out there. If you know, like uh, Tino's in the thing, citizen, uh, citizen institution, my boy. So, uh, 
but even si despite that, I, I, I'll let them pull my uh, uh, election vote out of my cold, dead hands. So, so who are you supporting in the race, or, or have you decided yet? I'm going to write in Lori <laughs> Spencer and Rick. <laughs> well, you know, Rick's Canadian, eh? <laughs> he can't be the president. <laughs> uh, hey, neither can Dr. Shiva, but no, he's still running. Neither anybody. can Shank, but he's still running. <laughs> Yeah, right. So why not, Lori and Rick for president? Lori and Rick for twenty twenty four, baby. How about a Lori pasta ticket? <laughs> oh hell There's yeah, let's do it. Ticket, right? We'll find a way to get along. And yeah. you want to be my vice, or I have to be your vice? <laughs> I'll be your vice. There you, you got go. it. Let's go. <laughs> Meatballs for think, everybody. Uh, the country's ready for a woman president yet. But maybe a woman vice president, yeah, right. Uh, right? And that's why we're here. We're talking about Nicole Shanahan. So we don't know her take on the Middle East situation yet. So just as a general sense, uh, what did you get out of her speech yesterday, Pasta? What did you think of her? Like I said, um, well, the connections, the financial connections, the ex-husband, right, from Google uh, was a little yeah. concerning. The philanthropist uh, lines and ties to Event 201, very concerning. Um, if I was part of the Kennedy team, I would probably um, try to lock in Tulsi early uh, if we if there was a possibility. I don't know. We don't know where her head's at. I mean, she just spoke at Mar-a-Lago. Um, obviously, I think the vice president, picking the vice president means a little bit more today than it did in past years because it could elevate uh, the candidate to get different votes uh, and, and pick up where that candidate is lagging behind. Um but I was, if, if I was part of the political team, I'd save now. And not at all. The, there's no popular populist appeal from this woman. The, like I said, the ties to Event 201, the, the Google ties, very, very, very concerning. Uh, however, everything she spoke about were things that, you know this, Lori, things I was excited about when Bobby first entered this race. To talk about SSRIs. Nobody's brought that up besides Bobby Kennedy. I was so excited about talking about these issues. So even though what she, what she says uh, is very much the three things that she had talked about that she wanted to elevate more than anything, uh, I was very excited about it. Unfortunately, I think it's just going to fall on deaf ears. I see that Jay has his hand up. Go ahead, Jay. By the way, it was great to have hey. you on Maverick News yesterday. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. What up, Jay? Hey, what's going on, Craig? What's up, Lori? How y'all doing today? Doing great. Nice to have you back. So you've yes, had yes, a, thank you. uh, 24 hours now to absorb Nicole Shanahan and her speech and sleep on it. And I'm just kind of wondering if today, a day after the speech, you know, at first uh, people had to, you know, kind of figure out who she was, take some time, think on it, sleep on it. And I'm wondering if people are warming to her more today because I'm I'm polling it. I have a poll question out. In fact, I'll I'll put that in the nest. I'm just kind of looking at comments online. And I will say that yesterday during the live stream, it was very interesting how when Bobby first announced her name, I was watching the chat room, right? And the immediate response right off the bat was, oh, my God, no, 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 I don't like this. I don't like this. And then the more she started talking, I, I just kept watching the chat throughout her speech. And all that, oh, my God, I hate this woman turned into, oh, my God, I love this woman by the end of the speech. And so I, I'm just curious, where what's the temperature today? How are people feeling about her today? Jay, go ahead. What do you think? Yeah, so um, to be honest, uh, you know, I, I guess my feelings might mirror Craig's, but a little bit less negative. So, you know, the jury's still out. You know, I don't want to make any prejudgments. And the only reason why I would say that is because, um, you know, I do have a ton of respect for Bobby. Um, and while I would say I agree um, with Craig's position on Palestine, I wouldn't say I think he's compromised. I would say um, I think Mossad has the most ruthless assassination agency, um, you know, through Mossad of any intelligence agency. So uh, he's probably doing his best to make it to the election uh, more than anything. So uh, I don't think he's compromised, but that's just my opinion. Um, but uh, in terms of Nicole Shanahan, um, you know, I would say 
Uh, right now, I'm waiting um, to see if she's going to make the rounds on the podcast, um, like how Kennedy's been doing. And I want to see how she responds, um, you know, if she goes on Joe Rogan. And I really hope um, that, you know, people are going to ask her about what's going on with Event 201 because uh, I noticed that, uh, I'm sorry, Whitney Webb pointed out that some of her organizations um, have been uh, kind of uh, burying their connections to Event 201 in the weeks leading up to the election. So um, I, that really worried me because one of the things I love about Bobby is his transparency. Like, you know, he tells us, uh, why he evolved on Russia Gate, and uh, he doesn't try to shy away from it. Like he explains the whole thing. So I want to hear that same kind of radical transparency um, from Nicole Shanahan um, on her uh, ties to Event Two Hundred One, and she can explain that, and then maybe hold big tech accountable um, the same way uh, Bobby is holding BlackRock and Vanguard accountable. Um, then that experience she has with big tech, um, you know, will. Uh, definitely inspire me more. But until that point, you know, to to be completely honest with you, you know, um, and Laura, you know, you've been censored by YouTube. So uh, you oh, yeah. know how bad the censorship is, right? Well, who owns YouTube, Laura? Google. See, I, exactly. I'm looking at this so, as a plus, though. I'm thinking now that she's on the ticket, maybe she can call up her ex-old man and say, hey, stop censoring Bobby Kennedy. <laughs> maybe they can <laughs> you know, settle this thing That would be great. That would be great. I would love for that to happen. But, you know, like, my, and again, I'm having an open mind because I'm going to wait to see how she does on the podcast circuit. But from where I'm standing, I'm looking at it like, OK, she was married to someone who has been, um, you know, manipulating search results um, for the past decade. Um, that's what Google has been, you know, proved to be doing in court. So, you know, I love Bobby. I trust Bobby. You know, I hope that he's making the best decision. But deep down, uh, I have to tell you, Lori, I'm a little bit worried at the moment because I think JFK's biggest mistake was choosing LBJ as his running mate. And, you know, I think we need to have someone in that VP position who we can trust um, to, you know, hold it down and who the deep state would not feel comfortable would reverse any progress made under Bobby um, if for some reason he was no longer able to serve. So, you know, that that's kind of what I'm looking out for. So I'm not done with the campaign. I'm not saying I would vote for anyone else yet. You know, I'm still uh, waiting to see what happens. I think he's by far the best pick between Biden, Trump, um, you know, and him. So, but I do want to hear Nicole answer some more questions about those thing, uh, things I mentioned. But mm -hmm. I see you have a lot of hands up right now, so I don't want to take up too much time. Um, I'll let you get to those hands. That was awesome, Jay. I have the same questions too. We still have a lot more to know about Nicole. Um, we learned a lot yesterday. Um, we got a good general feel for her. But, you know, she's never, that I'm aware of in her life, ever written any articles on political issues. We don't really know what her stand is on things like, you know, the Second Amendment, abortion, as Craig just brought up, the war in Gaza, the war in Ukraine, uh, the global economy. There's so many things that are on the minds of voters this year, and we, it's all unknown to us at this point. Um, so I look forward to learning more about that. And I see we've got a lot of hands up and a lot of people requesting to speak. And let's go to your friend, Citizen Intuition. And I just sent you a follow back, Citizen. It's you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Hi, Lori. Thank you. And Craig. Yeah. Good to see you on here. Um, so there's two aspects that I'm going, going to touch on. And because it, it's a very broad conversation and I, I want to try to stay focused. Uh, regarding very quickly the Israel-Palestine situation, look, he could have taken a very middle ground approach. I don't know what Shanahan's uh, positions are there. Her positions there aren't a concern as much as it is elsewhere. But in terms of RFK Jr., he could have taken the middle ground approach, talked about the relationship briefly between Israel and uh, Hamas. But my biggest issue was when he referred to the Palestinian people as some of the most pampered people in the world, as children were being bombed, killed, displaced, children that he's supposed to be defending. It's not children's health defense with the exception of Palestinian people. So at a bare minimum, 
he should have spoken up for them and he didn't initially. And what I see him doing now, I feel like is a PR cleanup for, you know, can I prove it? No, not necessarily, but that's, that's my intuition that I'm getting Um, regarding Shanahan. So this part is a little bit complex because I look at the United Nations sustainable development goals, the world economic forum, the transitions that are underway in medicine uh, energy, climate, and one of the biggest issues that I think RFK Jr. has in terms of his past is his position on climate change. Um, and and so we're now in a situation, I saw an interview recently where he was trying to separate environmental work from climate change because he didn't want to address climate change because it's too much of a cultural divide. And on the surface, that sounds great. But considering his past, his his work separate from environmental work and, and, the, and the wonderful things that he's done as a lawyer there. And, and I, I can't discredit some of the work that he's done. A lot of his remarks about climate change and the, and the direction that he was going there are a huge concern when it comes to the sustainable development goals and her background specifically in terms of artificial intelligence and some of the things that she's talked about in identifying some of the health issues. You know, I, I'm concerned that we haven't talked about genetic privacy enough. I'm concerned that we haven't uh, addressed. I've never heard RFK Jr. ever critique the IPCC, the Intergovernmental panel on climate change. I've never heard him say a negative word about them at all. And they use the computer models to create these different uh, predictions on a low and high end. And they're always fear mongering us with those predictions. So her role and her connection to some of these massive corporations and their role in the public private private partnership section uh, and the relationships they have with um, governments around the world, not just the United States, there's a much bigger picture, a much much bigger umbrella that I'm hoping that RFK Jr. supporters, instead of going into default mode and defending every single thing that he does, that they're willing to push him harder on some of these important topics and get him to start talking more about climate change. Even though it's a divisive topic, he should not be given the free pass to only go at environmental considering his past on climate change. You know, uh, I've, Gosh, I've been following Bobby's environmental career for 30 plus years now. And something that, you know, he's really not, I've never considered him like a, a real progressive on climate change. I look at him more as an old school conservationist, sort of in the tradition of Lady Bird Johnson, um, in that his main concern has always been the protection of our natural landscapes, our waterways, uh, our earth, our air, you know, he sues polluters. That's what he does. I, he's not really been, he, he dabbled a little bit in the clean energy oh. initiatives, had some investments in solar and wind, but you know, his main thing is just suing polluters. And to me, that yeah. makes him more of a Teddy Roosevelt style uh, conservationist in the old school way. Um, and that's why a lot of Republicans find him palatable. If he were a climate change wacko, they wouldn't support him. You know what I mean? Uh, let's go to Anna. Hello, beautiful. How are you? Great to see Hi. you. I'm, I'm good. How are you? Terrific. Tell me your thoughts on so, Nicole Shanahan. So I have, I try to stay focused a little bit. I can ramble. So I write down what I want to say, but um, <laughs> oh, she's organized. I love it. <laughs> so the first yeah. thing I want to say, just to get it out of the way real quick, um, I am literally like a woman's empowerment, like photographer and everything. Like I'm a feminist. Okay. So when people talk about her exes, it really bothers me because women are more than the men they sleep with. Okay. Like she, she started her company before she even started dating the Google guy. Like she did that herself. She got herself through law school. So it's really disheartening to see people just talk down on her because, oh, the Google guy made her rich. And that's really not true. Like she made herself rich before she even met him. Um, and we all make mistakes. So, you know, they're not together anymore. And any past things that she's done, 
donating to Democrats. Like, I don't know why people find that so shocking when she was a Democrat and now she's saying she left the party. Um, we all left a party to support Kennedy. So I don't know why it's so shocking that she left a Democrat party and donated to Democrats. Um, so that that's a, just one thing I wanted to say. Um, the other thing, this is just um, campaign wide of frustration I've had from the very beginning. Um, and I've tried to reach out to people in the campaign to tell them this. Um, I, I think they need to hire a PR person or even a PR firm because this is from the very start. I've said this, they have let other people tell Bobby's story for him. Like when you go, I mean, we all know you go online and every single article says he's the anti-vax, like crazy person, whatever. And I think if they just came out and said, he is pro science, he is not anti-vax. He is pro science. So now people that call him anti-vax, if they, if he simply says, listen, I am not getting rid of your vaccines. You want to take 50,000 boosters, go for it. <laughs> All I'm saying is I want placebo studies done. Don't you? And then it, it makes them look stupid if they're against science. So from the very start, I've said this, we need to take back the narrative. I'm so sick of other people telling the story. So now we have Nicole. And once again, they have let other people tell her story. I wish in her speech yesterday, or even through a uh, subsequent post online to learn more about her. I wish she just, <sighs> this is how I'm going to explain it. Have you guys seen like the Eminem movie where at the end he goes to rap and um, they he literally uh, they're like doing like a rap battle. OK, and he's like, you know what? I am a bum. And like, I do live with my mom. And like he's saying all the negative things the guy could possibly throw at him. So the other guy has nothing to say. He's like, oh, he just he threw it all out there. That's exactly what the campaign should be doing. Nicole should have said, listen. Yeah, I used to donate to these people, guys, but I'm done with that because it got us here. It got us here and we're nowhere. So imagine she came out and said those things. They would not have any f fuel for the fire today to go after her. So yeah, I, I, I see just, what you again, mean. Like, I am so done with other people telling the campaign story. Like we need to be telling the story. <clears throat> so that's my uh, Lori, I just want to say I have to jump off right now, and I just want to thank everybody for allowing me the space to speak. And despite my feelings on RFK, I don't hold it against anybody here that's going to support him. Uh, I think you're all beautiful people. You made some great points. Even Augustus, where it, it got a little heated in the war room. I love you too, brother. I followed you. Please follow me back. Same thing that you just said, Anna, too. Some amazing things. And you're right. Like, a, a woman is more than who she was married to or who she slept with in the past. You're absolutely right. Uh, I do think, however, the, the ties to 201 is the thing that's a little bit – makes everybody a little bit cautious. But this is room for more dialogue, more discourse. And I want to invite everybody to come on my show, uh, Pasta to Go. We're going to have Lori Spencer uh, on soon, and we're going to have a pasta <laughs> off. And uh, thank you all so much. Thank you all so much for allowing me uh, the opportunity to speak with you. Well, all I have a mission, today. Craig. I'm going to win you back to Team Kennedy. Watch me. Oh, that's going to be a oh, tough one. Me. That's going to be a tough one. <laughs> I I, listen, you might not win me back to Team Kennedy, but I've always been Team Spencer, <laughs> and don't you forget yeah, it. Yeah, see, I'm gonna, we're going to get you back on Team Kennedy. I know. I love a good challenge. We'll see. We'll see. You're a good challenge, so we're going to work yeah. it out, darling. You know, I, I want to have an interview with him still. You know what? I want to ask him more than anything, and I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. One of the questions, and I'm going to break it down to different sections, but I want to ask him, what are your thoughts, Mr. Kennedy, on chemtrails? Because her second point yesterday, was she talking about electromagnetic, right, it, within the air? I mean, was she talking about 5G? Is she talking about chemtrails? That's kind of interesting, and I'd like to know Bobby Kennedy's stance since the cat is out of the bag. Since the State Department has uh, mentioned now, uh, I believe it was Brennan, uh, ex-CIA, talked mm -hmm. about chemtrails. Uh, they, they call it cloud seeding or, you know, we call it geoengineering. But I'd like to know Mr. Kennedy's position on 
uh, geoengineering, and that's something I want to ask him moving forward. So we'll, we'll see. I'll give you the opportunity to win me back, Lori. It's going to be a tough <laughs> one. Uh, but like I say, you got me on other fronts. My Thank pleasure. you so much. Thank you for joining us, Pasta, and have a great show today, and we'll see you, you soon. You got it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care. Anna, you did you it. have any follow-ups to that? Did you want to continue? Nope, that was it. I was done, actually, at that point. She's <laughs> like, I landed my plane. That's all I got to say. Well, you know, I agree with you that uh, Team Kennedy needs some help in the PR department, to be honest. Um, I, I, Stephanie Spears has been press secretary since day one. She does a great job, but she's so overwhelmed with requests and emails. And I hear from a lot of my colleagues in the media their frustrations when they're trying to set up an interview with Bobby or set up a press opportunity or attend an event that, you know, they don't sometimes their emails don't get answered from the press office. They're that overwhelmed. And then they brought in uh, Del Bigtree as communications director, but I'm not exactly sure what it is he does. I, you know, the thing about this campaign that's different. Yeah. I, I haven't heard the best things about him. So I, I, I don't know. I, I just, Something needs to change or they're literally going to lose this election. Like, and it needs to change right now. Like, there's no time. Mm -hmm. There's no dilly dally. Now, Link, them adding Link onto the team has been, it's definitely been a lot better. Uh, I, I started following Link on TikTok like probably a year ago. And when I heard that he went um, and joined the campaign, I was like, thank God. <laughs> but um, but he's one person, you know, yeah. <laughs> he can't change yeah, We everything. need an army in the press office, honestly. So I actually wanted to ask one question. I would love to get all your guys' feedback, especially when we go to other people's hands. Um, so in terms of like PR, instead of like someone said that it seems like he's backtracking now about the whole Palestine issue and trying to maybe it looks like a cover up or whatever you guys want to call it. W do you guys think it would be better? For Kennedy to sit down, make like a two minute video, whatever, something short for social media and say, guys, I got it wrong. Like just flat out say, I got it wrong. Listen, I, I don't believe it should be this bad in Palestine. I am still against Hamas, but this has gone on long enough and there's there's nothing left for these people to even after the war ends to go back to and they're starving like all this do you guys think it would be better for him to just flat out say i i was wrong and it's bad like we we need to backtrack a little bit here well it doesn't really matter what i think or what anybody else thinks you know kennedy thinks for himself and based on the interview that he gave to reuters this week where he said Hamas must be destroyed, and that means Israel must finish their mission and that he stands with Israel. So I honestly don't see his position changing on that. Um, he is deeply entrenched, and he believes what he believes. His beliefs are deep and lifelong and sincerely held. So people are welcome to disagree with that, um, but I don't think he's going to do the thing that Joe Biden is doing right now, you know, Joe Biden's doing exactly what, and Chuck Schumer, you know, we've seen the Democrats are starting to cave in to the demands of the voters in Michigan and Minnesota and elsewhere across the United States. You know, they're worried about the optics of what's going on in Gaza, and they're concerned that it's going to cost them votes in an election year. But people like me, I'm old enough to remember the 1979 hostage crisis when Iran was holding uh, a lot of our people hostage. And that went on for 444 days during an election year. And that hostage crisis cost Jimmy Carter the election because every day on the news, there would be a banner at the bottom of the screen saying, this is day 135, day 136, reminding people, keeping it in their minds every day that they're holding Americans hostage. And what's different this time, they're still holding Americans hostage. Hamas has American citizens. They're not even telling us how many. They're not letting us see them. They're not telling us their condition. They're not letting us get medical attention to these people. So, it, you know, I tend to agree with Bobby Kennedy on this, that as long as they're holding our hostages, we should not give an inch. Give us our hostages first, then you get your ceasefire. Then we can talk about it. It's just really... Fire. It's just really hard for me to believe with all of our technology that we have that they can't go in and find just the Hamas people. 
Like that's what gets me with all the technology we have. We can't do some small missions. Like the answer is just to blow up the entire area. Like it just something in this whole situation could be better. Like something is wrong here <laughs> just with everything. And I'm sure there's so much technology that our military has that is like years beyond us that we would be like, what that's even invented. Like, I just, I don't think what's going on right now is a solution, but I think, I don't think you have to be necessarily for one side. And that's what I'm saying. Even if Bobby has said, I am against Hamas, but I am for like Palestinian people, like these innocent lives should not be taken. Then that's, I feel like we're all like that. I don't know. I don't, I haven't talked to anyone that's pro Hamas. Um, and I think that's I have. being misconstrued. <laughs> I have some friends who are literally pro Hamas. Okay, well, yeah. especially with like young people and everything, that's something that we talk about all the time that people are very conflicted on. Like when they say what's going on at college campuses and stuff, people are not, that's not what majority of people are saying. People are not pro Hamas in general. Um, we are just flat out across the board. I don't think October 7th should have happened, but I also don't think what's going on now should be happening. So it, it's okay to say, I mean, basically like what Candace Owens came out and is getting crucified for that just the innocent life being lost should not be happening. And I, I don't know anyone who's against that, I guess. You know, speaking of Candace, um, on my show Saturday night, Strange Bedfellows, my guest was Rabbi Michael Barclay. That's the rabbi that she had the very contentious interview with just a couple of days before she was fired. Some people are saying that that interview is the reason that the Daily Wire actually cut her loose. Um, but that that interview obviously went viral. Uh, it's got millions of views now, and it's very controversial. So I talked to the rabbi about it Saturday night. And again, he expressed a, a point of view that is pretty much identical to Mr. Kennedy's point of view, is that he feels incredible sympathy for these children in Gaza who have been victims of this whole thing, whether it's victims of the bombings, the airstrikes, or the victims of brainwashing. Literally, you know, all, so all souls are born pure, is what he said. As babies, as children, we are all innocent. And unfortunately, it is the culture, especially in Gaza, when in a place that's run by Hamas, where they are literally trained into terrorism and hatred from the time that they are small children. They're taught how to handle guns. They're taught to kill Jews. They're taught to hate their neighbors. Now, that's the real tragedy. And, you know, it seems to me that I, I was talking to a friend about this, and I was actually talking to the rabbi about it that the only solution that I see working, and it's a long, long ways in the future, you've got to remember this is more than a century long conflict that no one's been able to solve with these two parties that hate each other and just keep having wars with each other every few years. Um, it's what I envision is eventually a one state solution. I don't think either side will ever accept a two state solution, certainly not now. Um, at some point, they're all going to have to be absorbed into a single state, sort of like the reunification of East and West Germany at the end of the Cold War. You know, and that, that process, remember, took 40 years before East Germany and West Germany could live together in peace as one country. Um, and it can happen, I hope, I'm ever the eternal optimist, but it can't happen, no American president can make it happen. I think we're all trying to give our president too much power. He's not the president of the world. He can't solve everything. This is the most complex foreign policy issue of the last hundred years that literally no one's been able to solve. Ultimately, it's up to the Israelis and the Palestinians to solve it when they are ready. All we can do, all the American president can do is help to facilitate that sort of solution it may not happen on one president's term. It's, it hasn't happened in 100 years.
This has been a Maverick Multimedia Productions.